the theme of this meditation will be how to remain in the presence of God. How to remain in the presence of God. We are here in a Catholic church. God is really, truly, substantially present in the sacred tabernacle with his body, blood, soul, and divinity. We are just after Mass. Many of us have received Holy Communion. And as we know, the true presence of Christ remains in us as long as the sacred species remain. And that is about 15 minutes from the moment of ingesting the sacred host and swallowing it. So during these 15 minutes after Holy Communion, we have the real substantial presence of Christ in us. And yet, and yet it is possible to forget it. It's possible to become oblivious of such a grace. Can you think anything greater than to have the only true God, the Holy Trinity, present in you? The theme of this talk will not be focusing on the Eucharistic presence, but precisely when we walk out of this church, how do we manage to retain in us the consciousness of the presence of God? I don't mean then the Eucharistic presence which has ceased 15 minutes after Holy Communion. I mean the fact that God is all around. God is everywhere. And that God thinks of us all the time. God is aware of us all the time. In fact, it's more than that. At every second, God positively wills our further existing. If God for one second ceased to will our existing, we would all instantaneously disappear. We would collapse into nothingness. The very fact that for now three minutes you've been listening to me, it's a sign that God is very much willing your and my existing. Otherwise, we would have ceased. This loving will of our Creator that we should continue to exist, this of course entails his awareness of who we are, what we must do. So the question is not, does God remember us? Although sadly, some men and women nowadays sometimes doubt it. Very sad. Now we know, we know that God is always mindful of us, aware of us, loving us, and keeping us into existence, assisting us through his grace, guiding us through his providence. We know that. The question is not whether he reminds us. It's the other way around. The question is, how can we not forget him? The problem is with us, not with him. We are always present to him in the sense that he knows us, loves us, thinks of us all the time. But so often we, we human beings, are oblivious of God. And I'm not speaking here of uh, people who have lost their faith or never had the grace of believing, perhaps because they never had a Catholic uh, upbringing or never met a credible Catholic, somebody who would be an incentive, a prompting for their conversion. But for us, if we are here, I assume most of us are Catholics. If you're not, you're very welcome. 
I assume that we are practicing Catholics. I assume that we believe in God and that his love of us. And yet, I am sure, if I ask the question, anyone, who has been thinking of God all the time since awakening this morning, who was never interrupted in his or her awareness of God, I'd be very surprised if there were one, one single Catholic amongst us who could say, oh, I, I can tell you it's not me. Because just like you, I forget. I wake up in the morning, I say my prayers, I say more prayers and more prayers. I say Holy Mass. I study my theology. And then the phone rings. And there is something to do, something to answer, something to decide. And immediately, there we are. Forgotten God. Yes, it is in his name that we minister. It is in his name that you go to work or from home remotely because of the circumstances. It is in his name that you keep your fidelity to your spouse, that you try to discern your vocation. And yet, you, like me, we forget so many times a day. It's rather the opposite. We should try to identify these moments in our day when we are actually thinking of God, not as a speculative topic of interest. It's a good thing to study our catechism, but I'm not thinking of that. I'm saying, when? How many minutes every day do you, I, actually think of such a loving God and Savior? How often do we reciprocate his loving, burning attention towards us? There are times of public prayer. Holy Mass, or the Divine Office, if you ever attend a religious place, in Vespers, etc. There are times when we pray the Rosary together. And this is a formal act of praying, and we are hopefully focused, although even then, distractions may occur. But we need to find ways, with the help of God, to remind in the presence of God, to re remain in the presence of God, even outside of these times of formal prayer, either at home or in a church. When we walk in the street, when we get on the bus, when we choose the kind of bread we like from the shelf at Tesco, when we pick up our phone and check who is calling, do I want to answer that call or not? When we do all these everyday things, when we, wheels, we wheel the beans out in the morning, we should, we should be mindful of God. We should be aware that God exists, that God is good, that God loves us. You know, that's a great secret of the saints. How did they become saints? Because they found ways, they found, if I dare say, tricks to remember that God is, that God loves them, and that God expects a response of love from us to him. I haven't studied Hebrew, but I read somewhere that it's the same word Purim, which means face and presence in the Old Testament. And that's very, very deep. The face of a man is the same word used for to be present somewhere. And it's true that in our face are you know, the main senses gathered. We see, we smell, we hear, etc. So when we see the face, that is really 
the utmost way a human being can connect with us, relate to us, and focus his attention on us using like a radar, the senses, to be attentive to who we are. When you go to the airport or even everywhere now, you have facial recognition. The face is actually, with our uh, fingerprints, uh, the best way to identify us, our singularity. So we want to be in that presence of God in as much as we want to realize God is uh, turning his face towards us. God wants to be seen by us spiritually while we are on earth and face to face when we die instead of grace and meet him in heaven. There were, in the Old Testament, when the Hebrew people were wandering for 40 years in the desert, that was in the tent of encounter with God. That was these breads of the presence, very mysterious. No doubt a prefiguration of the Holy Eucharist. The celestial bread where the true presence of God is given us. This is the utmost mode of presence of God in the material creation. So any other kind of presence of God which we try to become uh, aware of is uh, lower. Still, because we can't spend our days and nights in front of the tabernacle, we need to uh, make a living, we need to see our friends, our family, etc., to exercise. So we try to make this Eucharistic presence last, that it should spread even on a lower mode during our day. What will we do? What will we do in heaven when, through the grace of God, we uh, reach there? We will rejoice in the presence of God. When we forget about his presence, particularly when we, we lose his grace, which is the worst thing that can happen through a grave sin, well, we are like fish out of water. We are designed to breathe, to swim in the presence of God. And when we forget it, when we leave it, then we are in a milieu, in a surrounding which is not for us, not designed for us. So in heaven, the saints, the holy angels, the Blessed Virgin Mary, they continuously behold the sublime and fatherly and tender countenance of the Holy Trinity. And they rejoice in that sight and presence. They are fulfilled and every day discover more and more beauties and more depth in the splendor of God. What about those in hell? Please God, no one here will end up in hell. But those who are there and those who will end up in hell because they will have died with a mortal sin and repented on their soul. What about the presence of God in hell? Well, God continues to maintain into existence his creatures, including the demons, including the damned. God does not take back the generous gifts he once granted us, starting with the very fact of existing, of being uh, part of a nature, human, angelic. However, because the human creature is designed for fulfillment in the presence of God, the damned suffer most painfully from the absence of God. It's paradoxical, you would say, well, they hate God. They don't want to be with God. Well, that is their, their subjective choice, but it doesn't cancel or modify their nature. They are designed by God with intellect and will 
and that intellect craves the knowledge of truth in its fullness, which is only to be found in the one who says, I am the truth, God. Their will, second uh, spiritual organ, also wants, desires the possession of the good, and only God is good supremely without any mixture of, uh, of uh, imperfection. And so those in hell, they want that presence of God. They hate it, but they cannot deny that it is their end and that through their own fault they have forsaken that blessedness forever. So even in hell, the presence of God is being felt as an excruciating want that will never end. So for us, still pilgrims in this veil of tears, as we sing in the Marian Antiphon, for us on earth, it's not really a possibility, one of the many options, to think about the presence of God. It is essential, because that will be our activity forever and ever and ever. So to start now is simply anticipating on what we will be doing forever in eternity. More than that, to find ways of remaining in the presence of God while we breathe on this earth is the best way to secure that we will rejoice in that blessed presence forever in heaven. To neglect the presence of God while on earth, to forget it, is the best way never to be in that presence after we die. In the Oriental tradition within the Catholic Church, that is what you may have heard about as the Jesus prayer, which is simply the repetition of a very simple invocation to God, Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. This uh, very simple prayer is repeated time and again becomes like the breathing of the soul. The early monks in Egypt prayed that way, not only that way, but including that way, especially while doing other things than formal prayer, you know, when tilling the land or you know, sweeping their cell. Um, they would have this uh, recurrent and continual, in fact, prayer. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me. And I read that after a while, it becomes like at the background of uh, you know, the mental activity of the Christian. When your computer is uh, not working well and you check what programs are running in the background, and you shut them down to save up you know, some activity, some energy. Well, if there is one program we always want to be running in the background, and that is that Jesus prayer or any equivalent. What we want is our soul to be always connected with the Lord and to repeat time and again this petition that we love him, that he is our Lord, he is our Saviour, and uh, that we beg for his merciful help to us. It's also called that Jesus' prayer, the prayer of the heart. Now when in the oriental part of the church they mean heart, it's nothing sentimental. We in the West, we have unfortunately um, dissociated 
the brain and the heart. Let's say we have love story, which, uh, where reason is not invited. It's a catastrophe. It's romanticism. It's awful. Throw it away. Um, the true, the true understanding of heart is the core of our being, which does involve reason. It's the emotions, yes, but very much as uh, ordered according to reason. And so this prayer of the heart is you know, the desire coming from the very center of our person that God should be reminded, should be loved, should be begged, should be worshipped. We need to find tricks to be reminded of the presence of God. Holy Mother Church gave us a major trick. I use on purpose that word because it's a bit uh, very trivial, but uh, just to show you how practical it is. It is the Angelus. The Angelus. What is the Angelus? It is three times a day when the day begins around seven in the morning, at noon, and when the day ends around seven in the evening, that varies according to countries, and it can be six or five or whatever. Um, it's a formal remembrance of the incarnation and the redemption. It's the whole Christian people turning to God and punctuating the daily activity with that turning to God. You may know this painter called Millet, and there is a famous painting, might even be a National Gallery, if it's not in the Louvre, uh, called The Angelus. And you see two uh, peasant couple standing, it's uh, sunset almost, uh, in a field, big field, and they look at some uh, uh, vegetables which they have been harvesting. Uh, so they are reaching the end of their days of work. And uh, they are, well, in fact, if you don't look carefully on the very horizon in the background, you may not notice the tower bell, the steeple of a church. And then you realize, and the title of the painting helps you, that what they are doing, they're actually praying the Angelus. Now, somebody I know in France, if you didn't know that, uh, called that painting uh, the poor potato harvest because they are looking at their basket, you know, with a lot of a sort of a not very joyful. And so he imagined that they're just, you know, very sad because there are very few potatoes that day. Um, okay, well, it's a mistake. Um, they are certainly, whatever the uh, amount of, uh, of things they have, you know, gathered, what they are doing is uh, offering to God their work during that day. And they are, it's all about the hearing. They are listening to the bell from the tower bell about a mile distant, which is ringing the angelus, and they are reciting it in the field. They're not in the church. They're not in the house. They don't have an icon in front of them. But they found a way to be reminded of the love of God three times a day, morning, noon, and evening. It's a good thing that even here in a uh, a post-Christian country, we still have uh, uh, church bells, and I think in many places still the Angelus. Um, the, the shame to us Christians is that we don't know what it is. Oh, bells, oh, well, what, okay. Well, let us think of that, and why not um, make it a resolution for us to pray the Angelus every day. You can have uh, the, uh, the prayer itself written in your missal or in your, in your wallet, or on your, on your smartphone, and you can pray this. I'm sure there's even an application somewhere uh, called Angelus, and it will ring for you, perhaps with the uh, sound of bells uh, when you are on the bus on your way to work. But a wonderful way, very formal, very traditional, of uh, being prompted to turn back to God, to remember him. What else? Well, we need to find ways why not have a screensaver on your phone 
which is a, a holy picture. Many people have that. Why not on your desk once you're back at work after this little episode of COVID? Um, why not have a uh, holy picture in a frame on your desk so that when you open your computer or whatever, you can look at it and make a little prayer. Some saints had, um, you know, wearing on the person physical reminders of God. It could be one of these, uh, you know, one decade of the rosary rings around a finger with just 10 little spheres for um, the, the Hail Marys. It can be a medal, but then it has to be big and heavy enough so that when you walk, you feel it, you know, touching your chest. That's a reminder. Yeah, when you, you change posture and uh, uh, the string you know, will stretch and uh, it touches your skin and that's a reminder. Say, oh, what is here? Oh, oh, that's my miraculous medal. Oh, I must be a Christian then. Right. <laughs> good, good. <laughs> In case one forgot. Um, the scapula, to that particular purpose, not so uh, efficient because it's so light. So you don't really fill it. Um, we won't exclude what even people in the world, like uh, St. Thomas More, was wearing a hair shirt. Now, that surely is a reminder. Uh, apparently, if you wear one, you can't forget it. You know, you know it's there. Um, it can be, you know, many other things, uh, obviously, prudently decide with one spiritual director. Uh, don't get up this church, you know, and uh, charging you with chains, and uh, it's not the point. Um, but reminders that physically we will uh, simply be taken out of uh, our forgetfulness and again turn to God. In the space we control, that is our phone, yes, our car, if we have one, there should be, there should be a reminder. A little crucifix there, Holy Picture, uh, St. Christopher medal, or something like that. Uh, rosary beads from uh, the, um, the, the, the mirror, all these things. And even more so, at home. At home. I mean, there should be in every room a Christian depiction, in every room, including the bathroom. Yeah, there should be. Little crucifix, you know, the size, scale, uh, refinement of it may vary, of course, uh, you know, whatever is fitting, but uh, every room should have it. Stairs, the landing, should be a little something, even if it's just a little picture, you know, with just pinned on the wall. It is just that. Everywhere, wherever we, we, we are, in the flat, in the house, there should be such reminders. Even more so, of course, one place should be designed to be at the prayer corner, and um, there might be a little curtain there so that uh, it's not visible all the time, so that we, we need to draw a curtain and to prepare for it with a, a nice icon, a statue of Our Lady, etc. In our bedroom as well, there should be such a thing. What, and I will conclude after that, what we can also learn to do gradually is whenever a contradiction occurs, when somebody at work is not doing what we ask, or if it's our manager is being, uh, you know, insensitive to us or whatever, when walking in the street somebody is rude, or the behavior is quite you know, uncivil, when more serious contradictions occur, um, like being attacked, being calumnied, being uh, reviled in many ways, when suffering in our body, in our soul, small suffering, big suffering, well, with the saints, we want to learn to use these things that affect us as opportunities to turn to God again. 
If we allow for the thing to simply crush us, make us angry, etc., or sad, depressed, despaired, it's not going to take us where we belong, that is, to heaven with God. But if, whenever that occurs, we train ourselves by God's grace to refer it to God, my husband, my father, my priest, whoever, was unkind to me in that circumstance. I feel anger. I feel resentment. I feel sadness. Okay. And then what? Then, dear God, please see my affliction. Help me in that difficulty. And proactively, we can do three things. We can Praise God, whose providence governs every circumstance to our betterment, number one. We can accept, embrace this small or big tribulation for the expiation of our sins so that we spend less time in purgatory. But sometimes forgotten, but very important, number three, we can offer it up on behalf of somebody else. We tell God, dear God, I accept that difficulty, that pain. Please, will you use the merit I acquire through my willful acceptance and apply that merit, convert it if you want, into a special assistance to somebody I am you know, worried about. My sister is in this or that situation. I offer up that little contradiction, which she, my sister, will never know about. But God knows. And God will sort of transfer the merit to be of assistance to that other person. That's the communion of saints. Communion of saints doesn't mean that only saints can help each other, otherwise we will never begin. Um, communion of saints is, uh, we, pilgrims, in this day of tears, can offer up for others. I mean, practical help, of course, you know, help people. But that supernatural exchange of merits. And so every time we suffer something, we can welcome it as a cross, and the merit of that welcoming is applied by God, if we ask him, um, as assistance to somebody else. Again, a very, very brotherly, very compassionate, very practical way of being reminded of God. That thing hurts me, I could just stay with it and moan. No. That thing hurts me, thank you God, I spit my sins, and please accept the poor merit of my, uh, you know, acceptance uh, of this cross to be of assistance to this or that person. Saint Therese of Lisieux used to do just that, well, every saint does, but she wrote that poem called um, I Scatter Flowers, and she describes in it uh, what these flowers are, and she scatters flowers before the Lord, and even she throws some flowers at his holy face. Um, what the flowers are precisely, they are daily specific acceptance of crosses. The acceptance is a flower and she can send it to the Lord because she knows that he is always vanquished. That's her own words. Vanquished by this scattering of flowers. He finds it irresistible. Dear friends, if we are baptized, if we are in state of grace, we know in conclusion that the Holy Trinity dwells in us, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. It is vertiginous. It is a bit frightening. But what is sad is that we forget it all the time, day and night. So let us perhaps during this Lent, already begun, 
let us make a resolution to use, to make ours, this or that practical suggestion I give you. The Angelus screensaver, the prayer corner, the, the medal, anything to help us become more mindful of God so that gradually our lives as Christians won't be to go from Sunday Mass to Sunday Mass and in between seven days minus one hour not thinking of God. Be the other way around. We'll be thinking of God all the time. Sometime for one hour, you know, I switch off because I'm not perfect. Uh, you know, that's the other way around. Until, thank God, we die in state of grace and then there will be no interruption. No interruption. We will be thinking of God all the time because he will be there. We will see him with our own eyes. May our blessed lady, who carried truly the blessed Lord in our womb for nine months, real example in cultivating that presence, but who also after, of course, was always mindful of him, even after his ascension. May she intercede for us and obtain for us this grace of a continuous and loving filial. Oh.